It's the bird emergency, and it's another one of our live streaming power panels. This is a power panel. Look at who I've managed to assemble this time. Regular co-host, I think you've been elevated to now, Holly. Dr. Holly Parsons. Adding Parson. it to my CV. Dr. Holly Parsons, Bird Life Australia. Um, manager of Urban Birds pro Programs, but I like to refer to the Birds in Backyards programs because it's just got a nice ring to it. Hi, Holly. Welcome aboard. Thanks for coming again. Thanks for having me back again, Grant. Oh, it's always a pleasure. And look, we haven't got we haven't got much else to do at the moment except sit in our lounge rooms or in our in our home offices, have we? Um, That's pretty much my life. Yes. <laughs> yeah. How? Um, just to go off track a little bit. How are you going? You've got a you got a real young one at home. How are you dealing with it? She is currently bribed with television and a whole number of snacks <laughs> to get me through the next hour or so in peace. So fingers crossed, it could be interesting. Oh, very good. Well, like I, like I know we've talked about before, there's nothing wrong with a with with a South Korea toddler yeah, <laughs> interruption. I mean that it's often the best television, isn't it? When it goes wrong. There's every chance today. Holly, before we, we move to introduce our heavy hitter, you've got a new member on your team. I do. I do. And she's just there. Other way. There. Just there. And and she's also, also a previous guest. When she was a PhD candidate at Deakin University studying the beak and feather disease, but now a fully fledged Bird Life Australia member. Hi, Hannah. Welcome back. Hi. Thanks for having me back. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always good to get expertise surrounding the fool. So it's marvellous. And the the heavy hitter I mentioned, Holly, uh, Professor David Phelan from the University of Sydney. And David's got some special interest in lorikeets at the moment. Hi, David. Thanks for coming. Hey, it's great to be on, Grant. Thanks for inviting me. And um, let let's start with with the lorikeets, David, because that was what I was teasing. I I had seen the publicity around the lorikeet paralysis disease, but uh, you let me know in a in an email this morning that there's actually another one as well. So, can you give us a rundown on what the what's being observed with lorikeets? Uh, recently in Australia? Sure. So, I mean, first of all, if you don't mind, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, this research is being funded by a grant from WIRES and also that I've got a number of other collaborators, one at Taronga Zoo, Carrie Rose and Claude Lacasse at the, at the RSPCA in Brisbane has been really instrumental in us getting a lot of this work done. And I'm just as a sort of just one of many that have been uh, actively in, involved in all of this. So um, our lorikeet paralysis syndrome, which is happening up on, uh, is a very specific uh, disease that we see during the summer, during the warmer months, beginning in November, going into June with a peak in uh, typically in December, January, and February in a very uh, specific area of, of southern Queensland, southeastern Queensland, and northern New South Wales, northeastern New South Wales. And these poor birds um, come in literally, as the name of the disease um, states, in a paralyzed state. They're, they can't move their legs. They can't move their wings. In advanced, advanced conditions, they can't swallow. They can't blink. And all of them have very characteristic change in their voice. And we think the cause of this disease is that there's a interference with the, the nerves that go to the skeletal muscles, the muscles that we can control, and that, that they are essentially paralyzed because of some sort of a toxin that's um, affecting them at that site. And we've done quite a bit of research and recently published a paper that shows that, um, that, that it's not caused by an infectious disease but it's not caused by the common toxins that we would be thinking about that might cause this. Um, and that, um, that 
the birds the, can recover from this. The most severely ones don't always, but uh, ones that without that are severe that we take good care of, and ones that are less severe have a good chance of of recovery. But it can take up to over 100, 100 days for them to get back to a point where they can be released back into the wild. And as anybody that's been sick in bed or had any uh, muscle uh, disease, broken leg, or anything like that knows that once once you're not able to move around very much and you're just laying around, all your muscles start to weaken and everything. And so these birds, we first have to get them back to the point where they can eat on their own and, and, and take care of themselves. But then we've got um, all this long-term uh, uh, debility, I guess you would say, that they have to recover from. And so it's an, like an Olympic athlete being put in a hospital bed for several weeks. Their muscles are going to shrink up and they need to get back into condition. It takes a long, long, long time for that to happen. And you can imagine that being in, in care for that long is a really in huge stressor on, um, on wildlife carers and veterinarians all alike because it takes an enormous amount time and effort to care for those those animals. And the RSPCA in, in Brisbane gets between 500 and 1,000 rainbow lorikeets every year with this disease. So it's an enormous strain on, on resources and a, a huge impact. So what we're trying to do is to find out what the cause is. And the way that we've done that so far is to test for a lot of toxins and to do our diagnostics and to look at some of the birds that have died under their tissues under the microscope. But what we're doing now is we're trying to identify what plants they might be feeding on that, that would have a toxin that might cause this. And so we have a citizen science project that's up, uh, up and going and it's on iNaturalist. And if you want to participate in this, if you're in that area of Northern New South Wales and Southern Queensland where this this occurs, then you can get on to you to our, our webpage at the University of Sydney. Just type in lorikeet paralysis and University of Sydney, and that will give you all the directions on how you can be part of, of this project. And what our goal is, hopefully by the end of this summer, is to have a, a short list of plants that we think might be causing this disease, and then we can investigate those plants for toxins um, and, and hopefully find out what it is. And if we can find out which plants are causing this problem, then we can uh, create a situation where we encourage people not to plant those plants or to cover them up when they're fruiting or flowering. And so we can reduce the number of birds that have this disease. The second disease that you mentioned um, was a, um, very different and it occurred on the south coast of New South Wales uh, beginning in probably January of last year and going through until the middle middle of winter or early winter. And these were lorikeets that uh, were typically 100 kilometers on either side of Batemans Bay along the coast, maybe even a little bit farther north than that. And they were coming into care and they were very, very thin. Uh, they uh, had uh, diarrhea, they, if you fed them, the food wasn't going through them and they typically died within a couple of days after coming into care. And what we were finding in these birds was that they had a very severe inflammation of their intestinal tract and their intestinal tract was pretty much shut down. And if we cultured um, a number of uh, pathogenic bacteria out of these birds, but we're also a little bit suspicious that there might be a virus that infects them initially and causes uh, their digestive tract to be damaged and that the bacteria may come along as a secondary infection after that and ultimately kill them. Um, the reason that, um, and so we got onto that very quickly and this relates back to what you're gonna talk about today, Grant, is is feeding and, and is it right to be feeding birds? and the first thing that we thought, since this was an infectious disease, that we could do to try to control it was to encourage people to stop feeding birds because these lorikeets would come in and they would be defecating in the area where they would be feeding 
and there was an increased chance for a virus transmission or a bacterial transmission to occur at those feeders. And so that's the first thing we did was encourage people to stop feeding so that if it was an infectious disease, which it appeared to be that, that they wouldn't be spreading it to other birds. I'll link, of course, to your um, uh, your page, David, with the uh, lorikeet paralysis syndrome, and then people can uh, can register with iNaturalist, go through the links there and whatnot, and um, and help out with wires. I've I've got a question about the paralysis syndrome. First, David, is uh, is it a large proportion? Do you think of each sort of small flock that that might be feeding on whichever plant is the cause that are, are susceptible? Like, is it knocking out large groups that are all feeding together? Or, or do you think it's more that there are small numbers of, of individuals within each feeding flock, feeding group that are succumbing to the disease? Yeah, well, that's a good question, and I can only speculate as far as my answer, but I'm, I can give you some uh, evidence to support my speculations. Uh, we know, first of all, that that there are some hot spots where it occurs. Uh, we did some, we did a lot of mapping, and show that there are certain places where it's more likely to occur. We know that it's more likely to occur after it rains, which may mean that they switch food sources that after it rains, the blossoms may not be particularly um, good. So it might have to do a little bit with the preference of what the birds are feeding on um, in the areas where they're feeding. It might be that some birds would prefer to feed on one thing versus another. Um, nature is always, uh, is never cut and dried, if, if you want to say that. And you give the same amount of a toxin to one bird and the same amount to another bird, and one might become sick and the other one might not. Uh, typically in one of our, our, one of the veterinarians that's been helping us out with this, he said that he would go out into his backyard where the lorikeets would roost and he'd sort of go up and challenge them. And several of them would fly away and a couple of them would just drop to the ground and hop away. And so there's, it's clear that in some groups anyway, that only a certain number are, are becoming affected. And whether it's because they're more likely to have eaten uh, the plant that causes the toxin or they're more susceptible to it, I'm not sure. Uh, do you have your suspicions of, of whether it's a... Uh, I, I, I saw that you, you have a list of plants that have sort of been... Um, noted as being prevalent in the areas where the lorikeets have have had the paralysis disease and it's a mixture of of native and introduced species but do you have a a, a sense one way or the other of whether it's more likely to be an ornamental horticultural species or that this is something going a whack with the native plants. Sure. So our hypothesis, our, um, our working hypothesis is that it's probably going to be an introduced species and that it's going to have a very limited range of uh, southeast Queensland to northeast New South Wales. And, um, but, but that's the whole point of this study is to try to, to get a better handle on it. There are uh, literally hundreds of, of introduced and native plants that have toxins. And quite a few of those have the potential at least for uh, showing the, you know, inducing the signs that we're seeing in these lorikeets. So um, I'm not going to bias myself. I've got, mm -hmm. there are several plants that we've already identified that potentially could do this. But at the same time, those plants, many of them have been there for quite a while. And we see a lot of lorikeets feeding on them and, and not necessarily developing disease. And some of those plants will bloom during the time of the year when, when we don't see the disease. So what's gonna be really uh, important is over the next 
four or five months that we get observations on what the lorikeets are feeding on during the time of the year uh, when when this this is a problem, and we can start getting people out to uh, collect samples from those plants that we're suspicious of. And of course, being um, the research being done by citizen scientists, the more the merrier, and the more the better the um, the data to make any kind of uh, interpretations or any uh, any kind of hypothesis. So, if you're in that northern New South Wales, southeast Queensland corridor where it's affected. Um, get hold of iNaturalist, register, and um, and take some readings or some observations. Make some observations. Can so I we'd just... be really grateful to anybody who can can do that. They can just look out their back window and see what the lorikeets are feeding on, or they can take a walk around the block or go down to the local green areas and um, uh, observe a tree, take some pictures of the tree, and upload it, and it'll be really, really helpful if, if they could do that for us. Holly. That's actually what I was going, to, was going to say, was that, you know, not all of us are, well, I know, so I certainly am not going to be able to identify every single ornamental or native plant that I'm coming into contact with. So I think it was important to point out that, you know, what, that citizen scientists aren't being expected to, to ID the plants, but to snap a good photo to enable the experts to do the identification. And we don't need to have the picture of the lorikeet in the picture. Um, just as long as you tell us that they were there, we'll believe you. And that'll be just fine. Uh, David, before we, we have a chat with uh, Hannah, I wonder, the rainbow lorikeet is often in mixed feeding flocks with other lorikeets. Now, are any other species being affected by either of these diseases? Yeah, so um, not really as far as the um, uh, intestinal infection that we saw down along the coast, southeast New South Wales, this past summer and autumn. Uh, we do see occasionally scaly-breasted lorikeets that come in with lorikeet paralysis, but I would say probably less than 1% of the, scaly, of the lorikeets that come in ha are scaly-breasted. So um, not so much uh, that, and I, I guess I'm not trying to argue with you, but the lorikeet, the rainbow lorikeets are a bit of an aggressive sort of a bird and, and they, uh, they tend to, uh, other lorikeets tend to stay away from a little bit. So I'm not sure how much mixture there is in the trees, but um, the rainbow lorikeets are the most abundant ones that we have. And they're the ones that are, that are the ones that are getting in most most trouble. They're certainly the bully boys of uh, of the Australian bush, no doubt about that. Uh, and they have something to say about everything, I think, pretty much. <laughs> they do, they do. Uh, Hannah, um, you spent, what was it, about five years looking at um, beak and feather disease. Um, yeah, almost. Mm. Uh, have there been any developments uh, from the work that you told me about in, oh, I think it was about episode 13 of the, of the bird emergency? Um, I think I told you our main results. Uh, we talked about the main results last time. Um, since then, we've done a little study on the possibility of co-infection with beak and feather disease virus and chlamydia, especially chlamydia cytosci, which causes cytokosis parrot disease, um, which is zoonotic and jump to humans, um, where we thought that it may be more likely than expected by chance to find co-infected birds because both pathogens, beak and feather disease virus and chlamydia cytosai are thought to be immunosuppressant, so it suppressed the immune system, which may make infections with other pathogens more likely for the host. Um, but we didn't find um, statistical evidence for that. And it may be that um, one or both of the pathogens may just not be as immunosuppressant as um, previously hypothesized by several researchers. But yeah, there's still lots more that could be done about 
um, studying that um, it's always hard um, in wild birds and because there are differences between populations as well. Um, we did find co uh, quite a few co-infected birds, although the likelihood wasn't higher than expected by chance, quite a few of our birds had both pathogens. Mm. Holly, I, I, I wanted to get you all together because I think the, the, the subject of to feed or not to feed wild birds pulls all those things together. Now, do, do you or does bird life have a view about whether people should be feeding wild birds? So it's, it's a topic that comes up a lot in the urban bird program and, and specifically through Birds in Backyards. We, we get asked that information a lot and it's a tr really tricky issue. It sounds very cut and dry when you're talking about different conditions that birds can suffer in. Beak and feather disease is, is simply awful. But the, the practice of feeding birds has been going on in for decades. People continue to feed birds, even though all the official recommendations um, from state governments are that don't feed birds. You should not feed birds. Don't do it. Don't do it. Absolutely. There are all these downsides, but people still do it. Um, there is still, you know, this huge proportion of the population that, that either regularly or semi-regularly take part in bird feeding. So I guess through the Urban Bird Program, we try and give people information on what the risks are to feeding birds, which are primarily around disease transmission um, and also around uh, malnutrition, so feeding the wrong foods and causing problems there, but recognising that people are going to do this anyway. So while we would rather you created a bird-friendly garden that's going to allow birds to forage naturally, recognising that, you know, there are people that, that do still do this and trying to give some guidance on how to do it um, somewhat more responsibly and try and minimise the risk to wildlife. Um, so we do have, you know, a few recommendations on people which for people which is around keeping the platforms clean, which is around um, feeding appropriate foods for the types of birds that you are feeding. Um, and also recognising when you have issues like, um, a, you know, a cockatoo infected with beak and feather disease that's coming to your feeder. Um, you know, depending on where you are, most of the time birds don't need to be fed by us. <laughs> you know, that the, the, there is situations when there's been like a major catastrophic event and we certainly saw that in, in the bushfires last year. There was, you know, feeding stations needed to be set out um, in those specific circumstances. But most of the time, despite how they may look at us, they don't actually need food from us. Birds are quite capable of foraging themselves. We don't have the, you know, really harsh conditions of Europe, for example, over winter where, you know, th those birds are reliant on people putting food out for them because it's, there's nothing else around for them naturally. That's not the case in Australia. Um, so they will not starve. Um, and interestingly, don't really become dependent on us. The, you know, there is research that says that they will continue to forage naturally as well as take, you know, a, a little bit of food that you're providing for them as well. So there are ways to do it responsibly, but really considering whether it is in the best interest of the bird for you to be doing the feeding, I think is really important for individuals to consider. And then if you're in WA, it is actually illegal. It, it, it is illegal in WA to feed birds um, and you can be fined for doing it. Now, I'm putting myself out there on the chopping block today, Holly. And, and, you are. And um, I have been feeding birds uh, in my local park for the last few months. And um, actually, Hannah, I, I started doing it not long after we did our um, episode on beak and feather disease because I was so bored with lockdown. I couldn't go anywhere. And... With as in, I, I, I'm speculating, but in the area where I live, we don't have a lot of groovy birds that turn up. But after the bushfires last year, we got inundated with corellas, longbills, and uh, little corellas. Um, we have a resident group in the area of, of red rump parrots. We have no 
rosellas. We have sulfur-crested cockatoos who have now moved in, and this is, again, I think, because other parts of the state are not as um, conducive to them at the moment. And we've got some galahs that rove around and, and pay visits. Now, the park is a big grassy area. It's a triangle enclosed by, you know, three, three streets. It's very highly suburbanised. And most of the gardens around here are this sort of 1950s, 60s, um, a couple of fruit trees, a whole heap of paving and a, maybe a bit of a lawn. So they're not they're not really bird friendly unless you're a sparrow or you're a ringneck uh, turtle dove, spotted turtle dove, Indian ringneck, whatever you want to call that bird. Blackbird starlings. That's what we've got around here. But then these corellas started turning up. There's a lot of onion weed in this park, so they have been doing their bulldozer um, cultivation efforts and turning it over and arriving every day. And I was watching my neighbours who were getting interested in these birds that they hadn't seen before. But my neighbours, I have some of them who like to throw their noodles out in the park. I think I've mentioned this to you before, Holly, that um, some people go and throw whatever was left out from dinner in the park. But a lot of people just go and throw out bread. And, of course, the birds will, will eat it if it's there. So I thought, well, I'm bored. I like birds. I wouldn't like. I wouldn't mind interacting with them. They're coming here anyway, and my neighbours and particularly the kids are getting a real kick out of seeing all these birds that they don't normally see. So I started to get wild bird seed that mixed from the supermarket, and I cast it around the park in different spots, in different days. So they have to forage and they have to go looking for it and finding it. And we don't have, I don't have any evidence of, uh, of beak and feather disease amongst the birds that I'm feeding. So if I did, I would stop. And, I'm, and I think I'm encouraging fairly natural foraging behaviour. And I think I'm giving the birds a better option than eating the junk food, than, than getting the McDonald's, which has been chucked out, out there all the time. Um, Now, hit me. <laughs> hit me, Holly, or don't hit me. <laughs> um, no, look, I think, Grant, you've really touched on the positives that can come from bird feeding. And so, um, and, and that's why I guess I sit on the fence a little bit on the issue is that I'm well aware there are a whole heap of downsides to it for the birds. Um, but in terms of engaging people and getting them interested in birds and, and feeling that connection, then bird feeding is one of the standout ways that people can do that. Can do that, And you can see that because you've got kids that are, that are interested. Um, I guess it's about how we then take that a step further from just feed the birds to, okay, well, what should we now do in order to help them? Um, so I, I, I can see both sides. Of the, of the story and I think the fact that you are spreading it around is is probably probably you know David and Hannah can probably clarify this is maybe lowering the chances of of transmission of disease um, a little bit at least rather than having everybody congregate to the one feeding spot um, so I can see some benefit there um, I think as, as, as long as, too, it's not something that the birds become then expecting um, because you can then get problems if you've got some of these more aggressive birds that are then expecting to be fed. They're not dependent on it, but they can chase away other birds that might be interested in coming in. So little red rumps, for example, wouldn't really stand much of a chance um, around a flock of corellas. Um, certainly not against a flock of sulfur crested cockatoos that are doing some feeding for sure. Yeah. So... I think I, in, I might, in sorry, Holly, I might clarify there too that um, a couple of cockatoos that I think have, I think they're probably escapees who have joined this um, this flock because they're really they're really familiar with me. Now they they did after a couple of weeks 
start to come and sit on my fence. Birds are smart, so they knew which house I came in in and out of, and they would come and they would hang out there. So when when that happened, I stopped feeding for a while, or I walked around to the very far side of the park and put a little bit out there. So so they don't become habituated to to me, and um, and and I don't feed every day, and I don't feed at the same time. So that they do have to come on a speculative journey to see what bounties are in the park and then they can move back to to where they come from. Now, most of them, I've identified a, a bunch of them that look like, well, that are from a park, a, a flock that hangs around uh, the shopping centre where there's a big creek and reserve and whatnot there. Um, but when... When they see me up there, they recognise me and they come and just see what I'm what I'm doing. Um, Hannah, have you got any any thoughts? Maybe the the main thought that comes to mind is um, we can't be sure that there's no beak and feather disease virus or no infection just because the birds don't show signs of disease because there can be subclinical infections. I had, for example, some sulfur crested cockatoos um, and other species, none of the birds that I included in my study actually were visibly sick and they still quite a few of them were infected and the sulfur crested cockatoos with really high viral load, so lots of virus circulating in their blood. Um, it may not necessarily mean that they shed the virus, why they are not very, very sick, so they may transmit it less. There's um, Still, lots of questions to be answered on that, but yeah, we can't we can't be sure that the birds are healthy because they look healthy. So there may still be transmission going on. Professor, what would you like to tell me? It's such a complicated thing. It's really hard to even just start in one particular place or another. Um, I mean, the the places where we've seen a lot of problems have been where people, for instance, have fed mints to kookaburros and to magpies. And mince has no calcium in it and they feed it to their chicks and their chicks get very, very soft bones that break. And so uh, we, we, there are recipes and formulas if you're gonna feed uh, magpies or kookaburros or any of these carnivorous birds, then you should be only feeding things that have balanced um, calcium in them. And that can be dog food or that can be mince that's mixed with vitamins and, and other things to sort of, to sort of feed. Um, so that's the, the first thing. Um, second thing is that, you know, putting out bread is definitely not a, a balanced diet. And we see that in all kinds of uh, birds. We can see that in lorikeets and cockatoos. And, and we can see that um, especially in waterfowl. So people that have black swans that are feeding or Pacific black ducks that are breeding on their local dams, you know, feeding bread to them is just absolutely the worst thing that you can possibly do. Uh, I can remember being in um, New Zealand where we stopped at a, a lake the first time my wife and I, and uh, uh, there's a, a call that the mother duck gives off when she's found some food. And um, uh, then the, the ducklings come over and get it. She says she points it out and then they come and, and eat it. And this duck, when she made that call, the ducklings ran up to us because they thought they were going to get food from us yeah. instead of going to where where the, the, the natural food can be. So certainly feeding um, can, can alter some really um, important um, behaviors and get them eating the wrong thing. Um, Seed is, is not a balanced diet. And if they were just eating seed and they were feeding it to their chicks, it's the same as if they were eating bread. Um, it's not gonna have any calcium in them. It's not gonna have any vitamin A. I have a, um, a, a PhD student, Michelle Plant, who's up from around the Brisbane area originally, who's done quite a bit of work and is now uh, finishing up her thesis. And we've got some really great data that shows that um, when you put seed out for birds, that they use that as a um, as one spot that they feed in, and they move around quite a bit. 
and that they'll come back to that area. Then they'll move on to some others during the course of the day. And they'll come back and check that out in the morning sometimes. And if there's no food there, then they'll go somewhere else and feed on it and, and they'll circle through. But what we're finding is that in these places where the food is always available, um, that some birds will use it less, but some birds will use it more to the point where it might be the majority of, of what they eat. And so a consistent source of supplemental food that's not balanced in some of these birds at least will, will um, uh, not be healthy for them and will make them, I don't know if it'll make them fully dependent on it, but we know that when all of a sudden that disappears, like at some of these commercial places during COVID when they couldn't have people there anymore, that that will have a, a negative impact on, on those birds because they will be depending on that for a significant part of their diet and all of a sudden it's gone. The disease thing comes and goes. Um, you know, corellas are, are normally birds that feed on the ground, so they would have a greater chance of being exposed to, to bacteria that might be in the soil or might come from other different places. Uh, they feed in flocks normally. So if there's beak and feather there, then clearly um, uh, they have the opportunity for passing that around. Uh, they're nomadic. So when the food disappears from one place, they're used to, to going to other places. I'm sure that the more food that's put out and the more concentrated it is, um, then the chances of disease transmission is higher. Um, and, and so spreading it out like what you're doing and allowing them to feed sort of more on a natural sort of a way that makes a lot of sense to me, and I, I, I like that idea, and I don't see that that's a, a major concern that's going to alter their behaviors. I think that when we feed them in a very concentrated area, that is the place that, that's the biggest concern for me. And we've seen um, outbreaks of disease in North America. We think that the decline of the house sparrow, which is an invasive species here, but is rare um, in uh, UK, now, where it used to be quite abundant, is because of salmonella that's been transmitted at feeding stations. Northern finches, um, uh, siskins, and grosbeaks are massively on decline, and we think that that's largely due to disease transmission at the feeding stations, problems with hygiene, uh, concentrating animals in, in one spot. Um, so it can be a problem, and while it might not be over many years, in your backyard, um, uh, new diseases can emerge all the time that can have major consequences like the lorikeets we're seeing on the south coast. So if you're going to do it, then you need to do it as, as, um, as carefully as you possibly can with sanitation. Move your bird feeders around. Don't allow the birds to concentrate in one area. Uh, don't Remember that most of the things that we put out for them to eat are not balanced diets. And if they're available to them all the time, then there is a certain portion of the population that can, can be negatively impacted, whereas not all of them will necessarily be. So it's a huge complicated story. And um, I think the main thing is if you don't need to do it, don't do it. If, if you really love doing it and you can't help yourself, and then try to do it the best possible way. Uh, David, can I can I ask you for some uh, advice on a ban on a balanced diet? If I if I continue to um, uh, be fairly judicious in where and how and how much I provide seed, what should I be also providing? to increase the balance of the diet? Well, there's some commercial pellets that are out there that are a complete and balanced diet for most uh, citizen birds. And so I would think that if you, um, you might try to spread a little of those around, mixed in with the seed first to see whether they would go and eat it. And then if they are eating it, I might encourage you to use the, 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 the balanced diet that's available commercially, because at least then when they're eating that, they're, they're getting calcium and vitamin A and vitamin D and everything when they, when they eat that. So I, I would try that out and see how that goes and maybe you could let me know whether they like it or not. Or it could be like the cockatoo that comes to my veterinary students 
uh, um, window every day. He loves the sunflower seeds. They gave him a cucumber and he did, was very quick to throw that off. Uh, they even gave him a crust of pizza and he wasn't care for that either. So you never know. They might not like what you offer them, but if you are going to offer them things, then you might want to try to offer them um, uh, something that's more of a balanced diet. Other things you could try would be to put out some, uh, some uh, uh, beans and peas um, that are more balanced. So some uh, green peas, some sprouted um, soybeans, uh, all those kinds of things. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if they, they were quite interested in those. Yeah, I, I did notice, David, that somebody um, had put out some, what I suspect were is guinea pig uh, pellets, a couple of piles of pellets nearby where, where I've been feeding. The birds have not even looked at that. They've been out for about three or four days now. And <laughs> they have not been, been tested at all. So uh, I've got mung bean and, you know, soup mix and things like that that you that that I've got in the uh, in the pantry, but also I was thinking about whether uh, a variety of nuts and things like pumpkin seeds and even occasionally some grapes or w whatever whatever fruit is in season is that a good idea to uh, supplement with? Yeah, I mean different birds are going to feed on that differently. Um, you know, you can have rainbow lorikeets that'll come to put out fruit in your backyard. It'll come to feed on that. Um, uh, the fruit will go off pretty quickly. Um, anything that's not eaten, that's still around at night, what's going to come and feed on it? Mice and rats. Yeah, I was I was going to go get to that uh, that problem shortly. I might, I might say too, I don't use any kind of receptacle because the lorikeets around here feed in the trees and that's where I want them to stay feeding. Um, you know, I think there's enough of an issue with um, bully boy lorikeets than having them starting to, you know, congregate at a receptacle where the crested pigeons and everyone else will come in and having pigeon legs nipped off and and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I'm quite happy for the lorikeets to just remain in the trees and do their own thing. The only ground feeding birds I want eating the seed that I put out are birds that feed on the ground. <laughs> so that so there are some uh, some seeds that have a little bit more of a balanced nutrition to them. Um, you can you can look look that that up. But most of the seeds, uh, but legumes and pulses, those would be the kinds of things that would have more protein in them, that would have more calcium in them, and and would be be the best. And if you sprouted them, that would make them even better. Uh, there can be some problems with sprouted seeds as well. So that's a little bit of a concern, but yeah. if you buy them from the grocery store and they're the same quality for human consumption, um, then shouldn't be any problem. Uh, radish seeds, you know, just all that sort of thing. And um, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised at all if, especially, I mean, the Corellas would uh, be quite interested in those, those things. Now it's again, something that they might have to get used to. And it might be something they look at it and say, I don't recognize that probably isn't as good as a sunflower seed. I'll spend my time looking for something else. But um, I think I think it's quite reasonable. Um, but, you know, even the Corellas and the sulfur-crested cockatoos, they are, they're opportunistic birds. And they come, they're coming to you now because the food might be sparse in some of the places where they used to feed, but they move around and they'll, they'll go in, they'll use up a food source and then they'll go somewhere else. And, um, and so that's their natural behavior. And, and it's sort of like um, seasonal fruit, if you think about it. There's yeah. a certain time when stone fruits are great and you go to the grocery store and get them right now. Nectarines are great. There's certain times of the year where you have Corellas there. Certain times you won't, but that'll just make it more exciting when they come back. That's, that's exactly right. And my, my philosophy with feeding them uh, with any of the, the birds is, less is more because I want them I want them eating the natural food uh, but there, there's not a great bounty of that around here without them causing problems where they get um, you know the neighbors will not like them uh, attacking their trees so I give them a um, 
a different option. But look, the ju- the jury's out. Holly, we we once mentioned, I think when we were talking about the um, designing or creating a, a garden for birds, where you talked about junk um, junk food plants and a lot of these cultivars that are copious in nectar and whatnot. Um, we've also got that issue with a whole lot of fruit-bearing plants and, and nut plants and whatnot. So do you, do you have a view, again, on what people should or shouldn't be planting when it comes to, I mean, the one that's always... People are always trying to get gangan cockatoos if they're if they're within the gangan range into their gardens, but they're they're feeding on hawthorns and cotoneasters and and things like that. I mean, should we really be promoting those as food sources? No, that's 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 right. It can be a it can be a slippery slope. Really, um, you know, we need to, and I guess this can come down to a bigger discussion on, you know, scientific literacy and, and getting people to understand ecosystems and things. But, you know, birds are one part of, of uh, an urban ecosystem or a natural ecosystem, but an urban environment is an ecosystem. It is a functional ecosystem. And so we want to make sure that what we're doing is balanced um, and that what we're doing is not going to have other predicted consequences and so in the case of cotoneasters and things of course there is a negative consequence of, of spreading and weeds and and things by planting those for um, specifically for gang gangs so similarly with feeding you know if, if we're putting artificial foods out for birds we want to make sure that we are not having a negative consequence down the line whether that is with disease and malnutrition for the birds themselves whether that is with our ability to get on with our neighbours because all of a sudden, you know, we're feeding 50 self-aggressed cockatoos in our yard and they're decimating next door's um, fruit trees or eating their lovely cedar windowsills. Um, you know, th- they, there can be those consequences for, for how the whole system then works. Um, it makes it really tough for an individual to then make the decision on on whether they're going to go forward and, and feed birds but I don't think that's a bad thing I think you know we we need to learn to to live t- together in a community and that's the community amongst ourselves and the wildlife community as well um, and you, we've seen you know some councils taking steps in terms of feeding at uh, around wetlands and lakes and things to try and counter the bread issue some councils are now suggesting some of the alternatives so recognizing that people are still going to come and try and give food to these birds let's give them some alternatives of the peas and things that are going to be far less likely to have an impact um, on the whole ecosystem as, as continuing to throw loaves of bread in the water yeah I'm, I'm really mindful of the fact that cockatoos can be horribly destructive and i'm sure the um the little corella particularly if uh, if we were getting the a big flock of them but we're not they're only occasional visitors um but the minute that that the birds were becoming uh familiar with my place and were starting to land on the tv aerial and things like that i just moved to feeding them at the far side of the park for a while because I certainly don't want my neighbours having to put up with 35 screeching cockatoos at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m. in the morning. That'll be the, that'll be, you know, around here, I would not put it past people to be putting out baits to kill Mm -hmm. annoying birds. So, you know, all these things have got to be sort of front of mind when you, when you are creating and they are new behaviours for the birds. That's got to be recognised that even though they are foraging and they are, they're definitely doing a circuit each day, cruising around all their, their regular haunts for a feed. Um, some days they're going to get lucky at my place and it's going to be a bounty and some days, some days they're not. And that's sort of how it should, uh, should be. I also, I don't feed small seed. I did start with, small seed but the sparrows and the and the pigeons just um we went from having sort of a handful of them to having 
75 crested pigeons, which um, they're going somewhere, they're parking somewhere, they're pooping somewhere. Um, that's not, uh, that's just not, not what, what I think my neighbours would, would want either. So, yeah. Yeah. Crested's though are probably not going to be too much of an issue in sitting and, and in car parks and causing problems that way. I think it would be more likely the feral pigeons doing that. But I think the other consideration is the opposite end, and maybe David can clarify that some of the bigger seeds I think can be just as bad. So the whole sunflower seed issue is because they are so nutritionally, uh, so energetically dense. They're, they're basically a, a big chunk of, you know, of energy for for cockatoos and things is actually not a great way to skew it either. No, I, I, I know that they love the sunflower seed. Mm -hmm, they but, do. But the mix I use does not have much. Uh, so they have to, I mean, if they want to keep coming back, they come back and they pick over what they didn't get the day before. And you know they have to eat the um, the sorghum and whatever else is in there. I notice that they everyone always leaves the wheat until until there's nothing else, and then they all come back and they'll and and they'll eat the wheat. So, yeah, David, do you have a, a, a another thought on that? Well, I think when we talk about seed, seed is a seed, and we don't really there's no good one or bad one. It's they're all. They're all deficient in vitamin A. They're all uh, relatively high in fat, but uh, sunflower seeds are going to be higher than fat in fat. I mean, our study uh, where we've looked at uh, king parrots and crimson rosellas clearly shows that they feed on the larger seeds first. And the reason for that would be uh, several reasons, probably. Uh, first of all, uh, every time they get a larger seed, they get more calories with for bite than they do if they eat a smaller seed. Uh, the, second, uh, the second thing is that they can fill up faster and so there's less time exposed. And, um, and so I think those are the two main reasons why they, they target the larger seeds first. But the calorie density actually in, a, in the smaller seeds, the millets and things is the same as in the bigger seeds. It's just they have to eat a whole bunch more of them to get the same the same amount of calories, so, but nutritionally they're they're very similar, and they provide calories, they provide fat, they provide carbohydrates, but they don't provide balanced uh, protein, they don't provide um, adequate um, vitamin A or calcium, and in an adult bird that's just eating for energy, it's not raising its young, that's not an issue. But if they're uh, growing, if they're feeding young, if they feed on that continuously, if that's their tire source all the time, uh, then then it will become a problem. Well, I'm, I look forward to updating you, David, and perhaps uh, doing something similar again. Once I've uh, got the pulses and the sprouted seeds and whatnot out there, and and as we get you know into summer, um, once all the um, the spring bounty in this part of the world is uh, has left the gardens. It'll be, be interesting to see whether more of the birds are, are sort of coming looking for a for a handout. Now, I wanted to switch to water to watering birds as we come into the summer. What do we need to be mindful of um, with providing water? How should we do it? And do we need? I mean, my my big concern with water is that people start providing it and then they go off, go off on a holiday and uh, and the birds get used to a water source and then it's not there anymore. Holly. I don't think providing water is quite as fraught as providing food. Um, I think you can still have issues of disease transmission and the like um, in them, but not quite to the extent. I believe I could be wrong um, that you can have with with feeding birds, and of course you don't then have, you don't have the nutritional tie out in as well. I don't know of any research that shows that um, birds are be become dependent on on water, an individual water source in a in a garden. I think. Um, certainly in drought conditions, that may be a different story. Um, but generally in urban areas, at least, there's, there's 
going to be some sort of water source around that are accessible for birds. Um, I think like, like food though, where you have your water source and what sort it is will greatly influence the types of birds that you get visiting your garden. So, you know, a beautiful pedestal bath that you have dropped, you know, $200 on that is sitting in, out in the middle of um, a garden uh, is going to provide some water and some bathing opportunities for the birds that are really quite comfortable as being out in the open and, um, you know, your rainbow lorikeets, your magpies, cockies are, are going to love that. But if you want to help some of those less um, common birds um, and, and you can probably this is probably better than putting food out because a lot of the time the food that we put out for, for birds is just satisfying those big aggressive guys that are doing really well anyway. But, you know, a, a bird bath that is um, safely lower to the ground, um, provided you don't have cats and things in your yard, that is close to some vegetation that provides a bit of a, a perching spot for things to be able to see approaching danger is probably going to benefit things like your fairy wrens and your smaller honey eaters and the like a lot more than positioning out in the open. Yeah. Uh, Hannah, had, uh, what should we bear in mind with disease transmission with providing water? I'd say keeping the bird bath um, very clean would be essential. Again, it depends on which species you're getting into to have some water or a bath. Um, it gets especially tricky from, from the beacon feather disease virus perspective. If you get parrots or cockatoos, um, the virus is transmitted by feather dust, by feces. So when that accumulates in the water or at the, at the rim of the bird bath, that could be a source for transmission. And um, just scrubbing uh, the bird bath down with a bit of fresh water may not do the trick but just contaminate that part of the garden because the virus is really quite stable outside the host and um, can only be killed by very certain disinfectants that are quite aggressive so um, yeah it's definitely um, a disease transmission risk having that but there's also this huge benefit of providing water in especially in the summer when it's very hot and dry um, I think it's just yeah a matter of doing it as cleanly as possible. David, have you got anything you'd like to add about uh, water or feeding before we sort of wrap up? Yeah, so about water, the first thing I would say is there's been a paper that just came out today that I'll forward to you that has some information about uh, the possibility of disease transmission at the drinkers that they're putting out for, for wildlife. And um, that might be of interest to your audience. Could put a link to that. Um, uh, the thing that just sort of came to my mind right now, um, and I think I think it sounds to me like a really good thing would be just using a little sprinkler uh, that you put on that doesn't that doesn't um, uh, necessarily cover the whole yard or something, and you could tuck that in underneath the trees. You could move that around, and and it's almost more like a natural sort of uh, water source than. And, it, and there's no way that that's going to become heavily contaminated with anything. And that they can go under there and they can get wet and stay cool. Um, that's one of the key things. I mean, you know, we're now having uh, summer days that are hotter than any of our birds have ever experienced in their evolutionary history. And being able to cool off um, is, is really critical to them on the really hot summer days. So putting out a sprinkler um, that, that they could get water from, uh, that they could cool off in, that they could take a bath in, um, and and moving it around, and then you don't have to worry about the water bath. That you virtually these concrete water baths. There's no way you can disinfect them adequately unless you bleach them, something like that. And even that's very difficult. And if you're like me, remembering to go out and bleach the water bath before you go to work, that's not going to happen. So um, it just just makes a lot more sense to to use something a little bit more natural. And I think that they would enjoy that and you'd probably attract a lot of birds to that and without a lot of negative consequences. Yeah. So 
Sorry, Grant. I think similarly following along that line too, if you've got, we want to make sure if we've got a, a, a stand of water um, that it is being cleaned and emptied because, you know, any sort of stagnant water is going to attract mosquitoes as well. And so we don't want to be breeding up mosquitoes in the garden and limiting your enjoyment, but also looking at transmission of diseases um, to humans as well. And, and we know, especially with um, feeding and with potentially with bird baths too. I'm sure Hannah can talk to this about um, the potential of transmission of diseases to people as well. Yeah, I, uh, we'll we'll go there in just a second. But David, I'm I'm guessing that um, plastic uh, enamel, you know, and and enamel pottery and things like that, and stainless steel uh, are far better choices for a water receptacle if you do want to put one out than having um, concrete or any other semi -porous. Yeah, and that, that's absolutely right, and that's fantastic. And even better, you can break, take one of those and bring it in and run it through your dishwasher. Dishwasher, and um, in your dishwasher, it will it will sterilize it, and you don't have to scrub it or anything else like that. And then you can have a couple that you rotate through outside and put some water out in those, and and that would be that would be a very hygienic way of of doing that. Uh, Hannah. Is there, is there anything that people can put in the water that can be a treatment to, um, like, I, I remember, I remember in cage, cage bird history when I used to have an aviary when I was a kid, there was always talk of putting erythma, was it, erythra, erythromycin in in the water to keep your birds healthy. Is that just um, don't bother. Don't do it. Just, just husbandry. Good husbandry. Uh, yeah, clean it. Yeah. yeah. Erythromycin is an antibiotic that wouldn't work against the virus, and um, as I think, and and um, yeah, it's just um, a matter of cleaning. And yeah, the things that would work against BFDV, for example, are just too aggressive. And oh my God! I've just. I've just gone down the ivermectin path, haven't I? <laughs> um, now, uh, Hannah, I, I just want to get you to, to um, perhaps tell everyone what your role is at BirdLife now that you've moved over there before we before we wrap up. What, what will your uh, job on the team be? Um, so uh, I'm now... BirdLife's post-fire assessment coordinator, Cryptic Heathland Birds, short and snappy title. Um, so still vaguely parrot related um, and a bit away from the disease topic. Um, so I started back in January and I'm responsible for post black summer fire assessments of mainland ground parrot and eastern bristle bird, which are both species that live in our heathlands that are quite cryptic, hard to see. You mostly hear them if you're lucky. Um, and those heathlands got heavily affected by the Black Summer fires across several states, and the birds weren't faring too well before that already, and now we just want to find out how they're doing after the fires, now that their habitat has been heavily affected. So where do they still occur? Um, in what kind of habitat and which areas do we need to um, protect as key areas for these birds? Well, that's really great because I look up at my my whiteboard now with for episode ideas and i have bristle birds but i don't have your name next to next to it so i'll be reaching out to you to talk about the bristle birds because um for people in victoria and uh with an interest in eastern gippsland and whatnot the bristle birds are um uh something we're really really worried about um yep uh, david is there uh, some more information that if people want to follow up on the lorikeet diseases, the two that we've mentioned in particular, um, apart from the University of Sydney page, which I'm going to link to, are there any papers or anything you suggest that the particularly studious might want to follow up? Well, we've recently published our findings in the Australian Veterinary Journal which um, is an online open access journal. 
and you can just type in lorikeet paralysis in Australian Veterinary Journal, and that will come up. And you can uh, read through what our findings are. And um, if you've got some scientific background, and even if you don't, I think it's a fairly easy paper to read. That will be that will be great. I'll I'll uh, do that task and find a link so that it will be on the on the page on the birdemergency.com so that it'll be easy to find. Uh, Holly, anything further you'd like to add? Do you, uh... Uh, look, if, if people want some more information on um, feeding birds and the, the risks and, and how maybe to do it a little bit more responsibly, birdsinbackyards.net has got some info on to feed or not to feed that you can get a hold of. Um, and I'll just also draw some attention to, um, I guess one of the downsides from putting food out for birds is that you might get increased rats and mice around the place, particularly if you're leaving the food out. Um, so firstly, make sure that you are cleaning up um, and you're not leaving food out for a huge amount of time. So we're not encouraging rats um, and mice, but also please don't use um, rodenticides. Don't put any baits out. Um, you can find out some information on the latest campaign that we're doing on that issue on actforbirds.org forward slash rat poison. And yes, um, I certainly got your uh, your email about the petition, Holly. Excellent. And of, of course, we very recently did a forum similar to this on redenticides, which right. you can find on thebirdemergency.com. Now, I'm going to open myself up to the audience for some criticism. I'll be putting a, a survey up on thebirdemergency.com and it'll be really simple. Grant, stop it. Yes or no? So, <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd really like to know what people, what people think. Um, uh, I don't mind being the test case on this because, um, uh, well, the whole reason of posing the question is it is fraught with uh with issues and i'm not sure whether i i'm not sure whether i'm doing the right thing so i'm happy to be swayed uh, professor david farlan uh, thanks so much for uh for being a first timer on the bird emergency your uh, expertise has been um greatly received thanks a lot well it was my pleasure thanks for inviting me grant it was great and, and do get involved if you are in northern New South Wales, southeast Queensland, uh, in that study area for the lorikeet paralysis disease. And if you're down around Batemans Bay, keep an eye out uh, down there as well. Look for the links uh, and get involved. And, of course, if you can support wires, because they're the people who are having to um, treat the afflicted birds, um, do so. Uh, there is a, there's a link direct from David's Laura Keep page to Wires uh, with the phone number, I'll also put in a link. Uh, Johanna Martins, jo <laughs> Hannah, it's great to have you back. Thanks for coming along. Uh, look forward to touching base with you or um, what other cliche can I throw in there uh, <laughs> to talk about bristle birds down the track. And Holly, as always, uh, thanks for helping me along with this and um we'll be doing something again in the near future i think i've got um water in the landscape uh penciled in hopefully we'll have our uh, our rock star personality to talk about uh water and then we've still got to talk about planning and um and the urban environments and oh actually Something else that came to me, and I, I want to ask all of you a really simple question. And, David, because you are on the uh, special interest in koala health, um, let, let's use koalas as an example. Who owns koalas? Like who owns wildlife? Well, they, they belong to all of us through the, the, the government. Uh, they're protected by the government there. Uh, you can't do anything to them without permission from the government. Um, so technically they're, they're owned by uh, the, the federal Australian government and, uh, and they're under the protection of the Australian government. 
now I understand the protection and whatnot, but if a, a, a an icon species like the koala is worth countless dollars to Australia in tourism, or it was pre-pandemic, and there are businesses all over the country that rely on people nursing koalas and taking photos with koalas. So if the government owns the koalas, why don't they appear as a line item in our national accounts? It's an interesting question. I, I mean, I, I, I always think of this in terms of hunters, and you're going to think that's a very strange sort of um, an analogy. But if you want to hunt in Australia or you want to hunt in North America, you have to pay a license fee and you have to um, uh, you you have to pay a, a significant amount of money to the government to be able to take an animal to shoot it. And the money that they take goes back in part to regulate the hunting, but it also goes back to the conservation of the species that they're they're working with. So in North America, there's a, a group called Ducks Unlimited and their whole focus is buying habitat that ducks use for in the winter and also where they breed in the summer. And they're very, very much a conservation organization. And, and while their members enjoy hunting ducks or just watching them even, um, their members pay to try to maintain um, the, uh, the animals in, um, and to make sure that there's a future for them. In uh, bird watchers don't pay anything. I want to go out and watch uh, birds in my backyard or go down to the street or go down to the national park, um, except unless I have to pay to get into the park, I don't pay anything. And I, I reap, reap, all, reap all the benefits of having them there, but I don't contribute to their conservation. In fact, I may, by driving there, be contributing to global warming. So I think that um, from a financial point of view and trying to maintain them, that a uh, a tax, a very small tax, um, one way or the other, on products that are sold that bird watchers use or people use or that people use uh, different forests or, or whatever, and taking that money and putting that back into the conservation of the species that we value so much, I think it would be a really good idea. Well, Holly, I saw your wry grin when when I uh, uh, mentioned the uh, th this whole issue, you know, we're going to go down this path uh, sometime soon. So, just keep keep that in mind. I'm I'm astonished that we, in this day and age, when we're talking about how valuable the tourist industry is, uh, that we have not yet connected the dots between the tourism dollar and the value of the wildlife, the value of the habitat, and and that there hasn't been a lot of work certainly not that i'm aware of about valuing it in our in our national accounts so look forward to that everyone uh, off the uh, off the track but um off the track from feeding birds but hey we're all about protection here we're all about protection thanks everyone for being uh part of the panel and we'll do it again soon of course this is going to be up on the bird emergency website and in the podcast feed sometime shortly and i know some people were watching us live but for those who didn't we'll be rebroadcasting it uh over the next week or two thanks everyone see ya thanks Thank very much Grant. Grant. bye bye